Hello and welcome to your daily listening book. Today, we're going to move on to a freshly released set of a large series of history books, The Harvard History of China. Today we're going to talk about Volume 3, A Universal Empire, The Tang Dynasty. Finally, we get to the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty, although none of us have experienced it, is remembered, basically, in a wonderful way. It was the pinnacle of our ancient China, and its achievements, whether in culture, martial arts, international status, or city life, were among the best in the world at the time, with all sorts of fun anecdotes, poems, and articles that are too many to count. But the book we are going to talk about, its author, the American Sinologist Lu Weiyi, who will be familiar to those who have listened to the first two issues, does not focus on these things. He sees the Tang Dynasty as a major change, or a series of major changes, including the political system he looks at the Tang Dynasty as a series of major changes, such as the disappearance of the military system and the rise of the imperial examination system, the social structure, such as the concept of the great clans that we have repeatedly mentioned in the previous two issues, which is finally coming to an end in this book, international relations, such as the Khan of Heaven status acquired during the time of Li Ximin, and the later intentional and unintentional Chinese status. There are international relations, such as the status of Tian Ku Khan, acquired during the time of Li Ximin, and the East Asian cultural circle that China later created, intentionally or unintentionally. There are cultural life, such as the golden age of poetry and the freer and more commercialized urban life. It is these changes that divide the history of China, or the Chinese Empire, into different eras, from the Middle Ages to the early modern period. So one of the biggest key words in the author's view of the Tang Dynasty is change. So why did these changes happen? The author locks on one historical event, the Anxia Rebellion, which he considers to be the real division of the history of the Tang Dynasty and the entire Chinese Empire. Let's follow this author's thinking and take a look at the Tang Dynasty as foreign historians see it. What was the Anxia Rebellion all about? An is an Lushan and Xia is Xia Siming. An Lushan was the most trusted Hu general of the Tang Emperor Li Longji, who was stationed in the north of the river and held three of the most elite military regions of the Tang Dynasty. In 755 AD, the winter of the 14th year of Tianbao, An Lushan rebelled and once occupied Chang'an, the capital of the Tang Dynasty, and Luoyang, the accompanying capital, forcing Li Longji to flee to Sichuan, where he was forced to execute Yang Gefei and later lost his throne. After the death of An Lushan, his subordinate Xia Siming continued to rebel until 763, when the rebellion was put down, but the Tang Dynasty also went from strength to weakness. This is the brief process of the Insha Rebellion, and I believe we can all tell a general story, but to really understand this matter, we need to tell its causes and consequences in detail, which will have to review the content of the last book North and South Dynasties. At the end of that book, it talks about the end of the North and South Dynasties unified by the Sui Dynasty, which was then replaced by the Tang Dynasty. What was the situation in front of the Tang Dynasty at this time? There were three main points. First, the importance of the South to the country was approaching or even surpassing that of the North. In fact, this was already the case during the Sui dynasty, so Emperor Yang had to dig the Grand Canal in order to transport the materials from the South to Luoyang, the political center of the North. In the Tang dynasty, because the North had experienced massive war, the country's economy was more dependent on the South and without these materials, the production of the Guangzhou region alone could not sustain the needs of such a metropolitan city as Chang'an. Second, the founders of the Sui and Tang dynasties, they all came from the Guanlong group, the full name is Guanlong Military Noble Group, this is the concept proposed by the great historian Mr. Chen Yinqi, this book also used this concept. Guan refers to the Guangzhou region of Shaanxi, Long, is the abbreviation of Gansu province, Guanlong, also refers to today's Shaanxi, Gansu and the northwest of this area, that is, the roots of the Tang dynasty is in the northwest. So in order to political needs, the Tang dynasty still had to put the capital in Chang'an. But the Guanlong group was a mixture of Hu and Han, 
So some of the big families in the areas with pure Han blood, such as Hebi, did not think much of the Tang dynasty's royal family. Thirdly, setting the capital at Chang'an meant that there was a huge threat of the Turkic peoples in the north. The political center could not play the role of an economic center, at the local level, the powerful clans did not buy it, and next to it, there was a strong enemy always there to watch you. In order to cope with such a situation, they set up a new position called envoy, in which the central government sent these envoy officials to the localities and gave them great power to deploy various resources. Originally, the envoy was a very special position, for example, some were in charge of population inspection, some were in charge of supervising the state monopoly products, such as salt and iron, but later, for military needs, the envoy was set up to be in charge of a local military, administration, taxation, and household management, that is to say, the envoy had almost exclusive power in the area under his jurisdiction. The earliest of all was a very permanent position, but the people who became envoys, of course, wanted to have this much power for as long as possible, so they repeatedly proposed to the central government that the position should be made permanent, and they did a good job, and eventually in the early 8th century, the envoy became a permanent position. So where did an Lushan, as a local military general, get the strength to fight against the central government? It was because of the system of the provincial envoy that he had the possibility to expand his power. In the era of Emperor Zhuangzong of the Tang dynasty, there was a particularly power-hungry chancellor named Li Linfu, who was the subject of an idiom called the mouth with honey and the sword. This Li Linfu worried that if the envoy who has made great achievements may be promoted, transferred back to the central appointment, then may threaten his position. So he did a very bad thing, stipulate that in the future the envoy can only be served by the Hu people. The problem is that the Hu people are all roughnecks, and it is impossible for them to become prime ministers even if they have made great achievements. In this way, An Lushan's opportunity has come. An Lushan is a Hu, and very complicated lineage, after he became a soldier, step by step to climb to the position of the festival, and eventually a person to serve as the most important three military towns of the Tang dynasty in Hebi festival, military, political and financial power in one person. Because of Li Linfu's policy of giving the power of the border towns to the Hu generals, it was easy for Lushan to develop his power, and his troops had a very high proportion of Hu people, who were all very loyal to him, so that he gradually developed the power to call on the central government. Then Li Linfu died, and Lushan revolted, and the Insha Rebellion broke out. The specific process of the Insha Rebellion, the book does not say much, we will not expand here, we still focus on its cause and effect, the front is the cause, that is, the reason why the historical conditions of the Insha Rebellion can break out, the following say the effect, the impact of the Insha Rebellion. The Insha Rebellion lasted for nearly eight years, and was finally put to rest. However, for the Tang government, the previous days were never to return, and the Insha Rebellion had caused some irreversible effects. First of all, in the political landscape, there were clans and towns. A clan is a military unit, which is, to put it bluntly, the respective defense area of those provincial ambassadors. After the Insha Rebellion, the central government's power declined, so it could not control these ambassadors, but let them dominate their own territory. Especially in Hebi, which was previously the sphere of influence of an Lushan, the people in power were his old ministry, and they were in a state of confrontation with the central government, which led to localism and eventually armed secession and division. In this way, some systems of the early Tang dynasty could not be implemented, such as taxation. In the past, the system of equalizing fields was implemented, in which state-owned land was distributed to farmers for cultivation, and then taxes were levied regularly. Similarly, in the military aspect, the early Tang dynasty followed the system of the Northern dynasty, which was based on military families, that is, hereditary military families, especially those from the Northwest, as introduced in our previous book. However, after the Insha Rebellion, this traditional source of soldiers had been seriously lost, and the system was gradually changed to a recruitment system, that is, soldiers were recruited with military pay, 
so that being a soldier was not a duty but a profession, with the advantage that the recruited soldiers were more powerful, but accordingly, the court's military expenses were also under greater pressure. Both of these systems had been in place for a long time and spanned many dynasties, so the disappearance of this system in the Middle and Late Tang Dynasty can be said to be an epoch-making change. The author comments that both changes indicate that the state was losing its ability to control its subjects and its finances. The state's power was declining, which, from the government's point of view, was certainly not good anymore. The once so powerful Tang could no longer be strong. But from another point of view, the decline of the central government is not necessarily a bad thing from the point of view of citizens' life. This is most prominent in the area of urban life. We know that Chang'an was a world metropolis during the Tang Dynasty, but during the Tang Dynasty, the life of Chang'an residents was not as comfortable as it was in the Middle and Late Tang Dynasty. In the early Tang Dynasty, life in Chang'an was more rigidly defined, and the layout of the residential areas was like a grid, with the main streets lined with one square after another. A square is equivalent to a residential district today, with walls and gates, the opening and closing time of the square is fixed every day, residents have to leave early and return late at night, according to this clock, after the point you are still walking in the street, or over the wall from the square, caught are subject to punishment, the only exception is the Shongyuan festival, that is, the lantern festival, can enjoy the lanterns, can be unrestricted overnight activities. This system, called the Lifang system, was initially intended to serve as a curfew for security reasons, but it was obvious to the residents that this very procedural life would not be enjoyed by everyone. So there were always people who punched holes in the walls of the square to sneak out at night, and it was repeatedly banned. After the Insha Rebellion, which devastated the big cities of Chang'an and Luoyang, it became more and more difficult to enforce the Lifang system, and many people cut open the walls of the square and opened stores on the adjacent streets to do business. The two hottest commercial areas were the East Market and the West Market, which were quite prosperous, but they were also open every day at regular intervals, so the economic vitality of the whole city was limited. In the late Tang Dynasty, during the reign of Emperor Wenzong, officials reported that everyone in the capital was now violating the curfew, so they simply lifted the restrictions on residents' working hours. With the increased freedom of the residents, the economic vitality of the city was stimulated and various industries gradually flourished, of which the author has chosen a very unique sample, the flower streets and lanes of Chang'an. Speaking of this, many people's first feeling is that some vulgar places, right, in fact, cannot be generalized. In the Tang Dynasty, there was a very high threshold of entry for those who worked in these places, and they had to master literary and artistic skills, and many literati frequented and lingered in such places, the most famous ones like Bai Juyi. Some famous prostitutes of the Tang dynasty were actually quite outstanding poets, such as Shui Dao, one of the four great talented girls, and Yu Zhuanji. Not all of those who patronized these establishments were there to satisfy their physical needs, but a big source of customers were the candidates who were preparing for the imperial examinations. We know that the imperial examinations began in the Sui and Tang dynasties, and the system continued until the late Qing dynasty, but unlike the complete, nationwide education and examination system of the Ming and Qing dynasties, local education was still very underdeveloped during the Tang dynasty, and educational resources were mainly concentrated in the capital city of Chang'an where candidates for the imperial examinations had to come first to study and prepare for the examinations. Here, the author says with a sense of understanding, at the age of about 20, the scholar, or candidate for the imperial examinations, had to spend a long time in the capital to study and be separated from his family. Because young men lived in such circumstances, the pleasures, social, cultural and physical, offered by the legal prostitutes of Bailey that is, the predominant flowery streets of Chang'an at the time were almost impossible to resist. Therefore, places like Bailey, and the residents of the candidates who entered the capital for the imperial examinations, often lived next to each other, and such places 
where a large number of young students gathered, slowly developed into a social occasion. So, it can be said that the openness, the flirtatiousness and the youthful energy of the Tang dynasty culture were greatly contributed by the flowery streets and lanes like Bailey. When it comes to the imperial examination, this is the most dominant talent selection system in China since the Sui and Tang dynasties. Before the imperial examinations, a person's upward mobility in society depended largely on his or her social standing, that is, his or her origin, but the imperial examinations did not ask for origin and gave people from the lower classes a chance to enter the upper echelons of society. In our first two books, we have repeatedly mentioned the gentry, that is, the extended family, which was an integral part of China's political landscape from the Qin and Han dynasties to the northern and southern dynasties, but after the Tang dynasty, the extended family still existed, but became politically insignificant. Many books explain that this is because the elites from non-higher families squeezed out the position of the sons of large families through the imperial examinations, leading to the decline of large families. This view is both correct and incorrect. Why is it wrong? Because only 10% of the officials in the Tang dynasty were selected through the imperial examinations, and it was not the case that the bottom elites eliminated the sons of the big families through the imperial examinations. Why is it right again? It is because the decline of the great families is indeed related to the imperial examination system. The specific logic is this. The opening of the imperial examination, first of all, is convenient for the sons of the big family, they are not all we imagine that kind of dude, a study test on the dumb, in fact, really said the test than the results, the children of the poor family is very difficult to pass them, because they have better economic conditions, access to more excellent educational resources, so, the imperial examination, this way actually, or the children of the big family to take. Advantage of so what did the imperial examinations test? As we said in our last book, the main criterion for intellectuals from the Wei and Jin dynasties was the ability to write, and this criterion was even greater in the Sui and Tang dynasties, when the imperial examinations in the Tang dynasty started with three types of examinations, Confucian classics, literary writing, and current affairs commentary. But slowly, the proportion of literary writing became heavier and heavier, so that aspiring candidates devoted their efforts to poetry and literature. A very popular phenomenon in the examination hall at that time was called line scrolls, which meant that candidates tried to find a way to send their best poetry and literature to the examiner before the examination in order to get a good impression, and if you wrote a good poem, you were likely to get extra points. So the intellectuals in the Tang dynasty were very biased and generally had little ability to deal with specific matters. After they got their grades, they could only enter the central government and get official positions, so these candidates from big families had weaker and weaker relations with the local community and had to rely on the imperial court. So, when the central government of the Tang dynasty finally fell, these intellectuals, who could not live without the court, and the big families they came from also went down with them. One more interesting detail here is that Huang Chao, who finally dealt the fatal blow to the Tang dynasty, was a student who failed in the imperial examinations, and his most famous poem is When the Autumn Comes on the Eighth Day of the Ninth Month, After My Flowers Bloom, A Hundred Flowers Are Killed. The fragrant array of the sky penetrates Chang'an, and the city is full of golden armor. The name of the poem is, after failing to pass the imperial examinations, you will be given chrysanthemums, isn't it? It means that you did not win the imperial examination. Although the Huang Chao uprising was suppressed, the blow to the Tang dynasty was fatal, and Zhu Wen, who later put an end to the Tang dynasty and established the later Liang, was also once a subordinate of Huang Chao. This is where history makes future generations lament, right? Above we have talked about several major changes in Chinese history since the Tang dynasty, especially the Anxia Rebellion, in terms of political system, civic life, and social structure, all of which were internal to China, but like the title of this book A Universal Empire, its focus is not only limited to China's domestic, but also to the external world.
We said earlier that the base of the Tang dynasty was in the northwest, so the main direction of their expansion, necessarily, was also placed in the northwest. And who were the Tang dynasty's neighbors in both directions? To the north, there was the powerful Turkic Empire, whose sphere of influence extended from today's northeast China to Central Asia, and was divided into Eastern Turkic and Western Turkic, with today's Xinjiang Altai Mountains as the boundary. To the west, there was the Western region, which is today's Xinjiang and part of Central Asia. The Chinese government controlled the Western region during the Western Han Dynasty, but later lost actual control from the late Eastern Han Dynasty, and the region was scattered with small city-states with desert oases as their strongholds, which were basically subservient to the Western Turkic peoples. The Turks, from the Northern and Southern dynasties, were the biggest threat to the Chinese regime. Shortly after Li Ximin launched the Zwan Woman Rebellion, the Turks took advantage of the chaos to force their way into the vicinity of Chang'an, and Li had to bribe them to withdraw their troops. So he kept building up his strength to deal with the Turk. Soon, in the third year of Zhengwen, 629 AD, the Tang army attacked the Eastern Turkic Empire and destroyed the Eastern Turkic Khanate a year later. Then the Tang dynasty proceeded to operate the western region, conquered many small city-states, established the Anxi prefecture there, and restored the central authority to the western region. Later, in the era of Li Ximin's son, Gaozong Li Ji, the Tang dynasty defeated the western Turkic empire again, and the Anxi prefecture was at its peak, with influence as far as Persia, the border of Iran today, which is the farthest westward extension of China's territory in history. However, Li Ximin was different from the previous Qin emperors and Han emperors, in that he did not just want to open up the frontiers and drive out or destroy the enemies, but the Li Tang dynasty had nomadic influences in its lineage and culture. He did not attach much importance to the theory that the Han people were concerned with the distinction between Chinese and foreigners, that is, the boundaries of Han and minority identity. Starting from him, many important civil servants and military generals in the history of the Tang dynasty came from ethnic minorities, and some rituals and ceremonies also incorporated elements of ethnic minorities, not only because he applied them according to their talents, but also because Li Ximin had a higher international vision, which, in the words of the author of this book, meant that Li Ximin wanted to build a binary empire between the agrarian and nomadic worlds. So Li Ximin was the emperor and the son of heaven to the Han subjects of the Tang dynasty, and likewise the heavenly Khan, to the nomads in the north, an identity that was also recognized by the grassland peoples after the fall of the eastern Turkic peoples. So what Li Ximin sought was to bring the so-called Chinese and barbarians into the country he established, or the international system. So the author's position of Tang was that it was a worldwide empire. Although there was a revival of the Eastern Turkic Empire later on, the Tang dynasty was basically able to maintain this situation until the time of Emperor Zhuangzong of Tang, and the situation changed, also due to the Anxia Rebellion. While the Tang dynasty unified China, there was a great power in West Asia that rose almost simultaneously, the Arabian Empire. They expanded from the Arabian Peninsula to the three continents of Asia, Africa and Europe, and in the east, they were very close to the sphere of influence of the Insha capital. Shortly before the outbreak of the Insha rebellion, the two sides fought a battle in Tarnos, a place in today's Kazakhstan, and the Tang dynasty army lost. This defeat was not a big deal, but following the Insha rebellion, the Tang dynasty had no energy to take care of the western region. At the same time, another powerful rival, Tubo, a minority regime on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau today, also began to expand its power and occupied the Western Corridor, separating the Anxi prefecture from the Tang dynasty's mainland. In the north, on the Mongolian Plateau, Huihe, also an ethnic minority, rose on the former Turkic territory. The imperial vision of the Li Ximin era was not maintained. However, although the political territory was shrunk, China had another gain, namely, an East Asian system was born with Chinese characters and Chinese culture as the link. The so-called East Asian system was the adoption of Chinese political system, culture, values and writing 
as well as similar customs and traditions, by a number of countries in and around China's frontier regions that were agrarian rather than nomadic, and that nominally recognized China as their boss, including Japan, Silla, Nanjiao, and northern Vietnam, which was part of China at the time, but later separated from it. Together with China, these countries formed a cultural system in which China was the core country, the equivalent of a star, and they were the equivalent of some small satellites. So you can see that today there are still many Chinese characters in Japanese, and in Korea, South Korea, and Vietnam, before modern times, their official script was also Chinese characters, and this is the soft power of culture. The Tang Dynasty could not control these countries and regions politically, but Chinese culture conquered them and brought them into the Chinese cultural circle. Later, after the decline of Buddhism in India, China replaced India as the center and holy land of Buddhism, which also had a great influence on these countries. There was also the fact that the traditional land-based Silk Road was blocked by the Tubo and Huihei in the west, leaving Chinese merchants to seek new trade routes by sea. In the south, Panyu and Juashu became important trading towns, and merchant ships from India and West Asia traveled to and from these places, creating the so-called Maritime Silk Road, which connected the China-centered East Asian system to the larger global system, and from this time on, China was part of the entire world trade and cultural exchange. So in this sense, China of the Tang Dynasty was a truly global empire. Finally, since we are talking about the Tang Dynasty, there is another topic that cannot be left untouched, which is the literature of the Tang Dynasty. The most accomplished literary genre of the Tang Dynasty was undoubtedly Tang poetry. Why did poetry reach its peak in the Tang Dynasty? In the author's opinion, it was because Tang poetry broke away from the cliché of court poetry during the Southern Dynasty. Although there were many poems related to court plots in the Tang Dynasty, there were also poems with border and garden themes, including many monumental works, to name but a few. In addition the uses of poetry were freed from mere moral preaching and had more self-expression, a change that amounted to giving poetry a real liberation. Tang poetry was so brilliant that it often overshadowed other literary masterpieces of its contemporaries. In fact, what was truly revolutionary in the Tang dynasty was the emergence of the Tang sagas, which Lu Zun called the earliest novels consciously written by authors in China and which were groundbreaking in terms of both genre and values. The author's explanation for the birth of the Tang sagas is very original, he believes that, to a large extent, it was because the country's plight after the Anxia Rebellion was so confusing that some excellent writers began to try to explore their own situation and future in the form of novels. Equally important was the rise of the ancient literature movement. The so-called ancient literature refers to the simple style of writing that existed before the Wei Jin and North-South dynasties, unlike the ekphrastic literature that was popular during the North-South dynasty, which was elaborate, formal and empty in content. The first two of the so-called Eight Masters of the Tang and Song dynasties, Han Yu and Liu Zongyuan, were the advocates of the ancient literature movement. The author also believes that the ancient literature movement should be seen in the context of social change. The spirit of Tang prose was mainly an advocacy of the ancient concept of imperial authority, which was also the result of intellectuals thinking about a series of problems arising from the decline of central authority after the Anxia Rebellion and the conclusions they reached. Summing up. That's all we have for you in the third volume of Harvard History of China, the Tang Dynasty, so let's review it together. In this book, as an American Sinologist, author Lu Weiyi focuses his attention on the Anxia Rebellion. He argues that around the time of the Anxia Rebellion, the political system, the social structure, the relationship between cultural life and the outside world, and even the literature of the Tang dynasty underwent great changes. In the early Tang dynasty, the era of Tian Khan was transformed into a cultural East Asian system centered on China, and the trade status of the Silk Road gave way to the Maritime Silk Road, in culture, poetry, legend, and prose all developed. The author argues that these changes indicate that Chinese history in the imperial era, from the medieval model 
has begun to transition to a new model in the early modern period.